They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue, who was possessed by an impure spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all amazed and they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture. Thank you for the picture that it gives of the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you that uh, it pictures for us the inevitable clash of kingdoms that takes place through the truth and teaching and being of Jesus. Thank you for the power that it shows us. Thank you for the leadership and authority that we can be resting in and resting under. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this picture. Would you bring our hearts to be open to you through it today? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. See, up till now we've seen Jesus as a victorious leader. We've seen him overcome temptation. But what has to be shown by the apostle, by the um, writer of the gospel letter, Mark, he's showing now that the underworld, the demonic forces, are subject to the king of light, the king Jesus himself. It's really dealing with cosmic authority. That's what we're talking about today. Power over rulers of this dark age. And we see it immediately here in this first chapter of, of the book of Mark. As uh, it starts off with this, uh, with this passage, I want you to think about the authority of God's word, of Jesus' word, the authority of his teaching, the authority of what he says, and how it goes. Now, it's interesting that it says Jesus and his compassions went to the town of Capernaum. Capernaum, caper, caper, the prefix of that, means a village of. And Nahum, you know, there's an Old Testament book, the prophet, Naaman. This is probably the town of Naaman. We don't know for sure, but it's Capernaum. What's interesting is Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but he was raised in Nazareth. Nazareth was a small community, kind of off the beaten path, really rural and um, set apart. And yet Jesus was there for a while, but he didn't stay there. He was trained as a craftsman. Some people would say as a carpenter. It would be a similar t terminology. But this is a moment where Jesus moves geographically. He chooses a spot to minister for the rest of his ministry, for the most part. It's going to be in Capernaum. It's a, a city on the seacoast on the Sea of Galilee. It is um, kind of an amazing place. And it's where he made his, his home and made an impact. Since uh, Nazareth was kind of off the grid, he wanted to be on the grid. It was on a major thoroughfare. It's where the Gentiles passed through to Egypt all the time. It was uh, a port, and it had a, a seawall um, that was a mile long, eight feet tall and eight feet wide, and people would walk that uh, seawall. It had docks that went out over 100 feet into the Sea of Galilee. So it became a, a very popular sea port or lake port there and um, got really popular. It's where Peter's home was. In fact, we're going to see Peter's mother-in-law healed 
in Capernaum. And this, um, and I want to just say, Jesus wanted to make an impact. Jesus knew God had, the Father had planned for him to make an impact. And he moved, it seems, strategically to make an impact. And I want to just speak to that for a minute for our culture and where we're at. Because I sense a lot of people wanting to withdraw from making an impact. I hear people talking about, I, I want to get off the grid. I want to be out in, this, out in the sticks. I want to be away from the population, especially if the population is kind of counter to God's will or God's, there's not a biblical worldview. And while I understand that, and especially trying to protect our children, there's this desire to keep our kids you know, from harm, philosophically, keep them in a biblical mindset. At the same time, if we follow Jesus' model, we would move to the most needy areas. We would be calling people to the Northwest. We would be calling people to the state of Washington instead of moving away to, oh, well, we've got to go to the Bible Belt because they agree with our philosophy. I hear that. I have relatives. I have loved ones. I have friends that their whole kind of focus is getting away from negative culture. And I understand that. But if we want to make an impact, we may want to do what Jesus did. He moved to the heart of the beast. He moved to the center of the culture. He moved to where there was a lot of interaction and a lot of population base. And so I just kind of put that out there to encourage you and encourage those that you know to follow Jesus' move because that they moved to this town of Capernaum. And most of Jesus' ministry that we're going to see here, it's centered in that spot, his miracles, etc. So it's important as we see this event take place, the authority that he shows, the authority is broader than just what he's, what he's teaching from his mouth, his authority. He's uh, teaching, but he's also healing. We've seen that a little bit. We're going to see more today. And what happens in today's text, he's casting out demons. He's casting out demons. So these three things, teaching, healing, and casting out demons kind of come together, and it is a strategic um, kind of move. What's it say? It says, Jesus began to teach. It's on the Sabbath day. One version says, on the Sabbath, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue. By the way, Jesus was a churchgoer. <laughs> Jesus was actively involved in the synagogue. The word synagogue is, just means a gathering place, a place of meeting, a place to get together. Synagogues weren't in, in use until the temple was destroyed in the Babylonian takeover. And then synagogues sprang up, places of meeting other than the temple. These were more like, we would say, local churches. Places of gathering. And Jesus, as was his custom, went to the synagogue. That's kind of encouraging, isn't it? Even on Seahawk, well, Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> yeah. You, go, you, you kind of look at Jesus as a model. Well, that's a good way to uh, think of it. His synagogue was his gathering place. And he used the authority of his word Look at this. Uh, this is from the New Living Testament. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he went into the synagogue and began to teach. It was common for them to use a visiting uh, rabbi to teach from there uh, for, for the service. Um, they would often have a place of the scroll that they were following, a lectionary kind of, kind of a thing, and they would ask the visiting rabbi to give some instruction. So Jesus, who is in that category, is asked to teach, and he didn't shy away from it. He began to teach. At the heart of what Jesus was about, he was a teacher. 
He was a rabbi. He was a leader. And what's it say? The people were amazed at his teaching. What Jesus was saying and how Jesus was saying it was incredible for them. It was something they were not used to. The, the stories we have historically from the synagogues, they would often talk about what others said. They would, say, they would give um, quotes of what other rabbis had said. But they would seldom focus on God's will, on God's word, on God's leadership. And Jesus did just the opposite. He had what I call was amazing. And what's it say? Quite, for, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of the religious law, the scribes, the Pharisees. One version says, uh, one, one use of that word says, he blew their minds. <laughs> you know, he spoke and it was, it's not working. Try it. Help me out there, guys. Forward it for the next one. Put down if, in your handout if you want. Amazing teaching. Amazing teaching. The people were amazed. They wondered. They were struck with the truth that Jesus taught. Now, like the prophets, Jesus would often say, Thus saith the Lord. Jesus would often say, in contrast, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. This was the authority that Jesus taught with. You've heard that it was said, thou shalt not commit murder. But I say to you, and what did he do? He drilled down to the motives. He said, but I say to you, you are angry with your brother, you're guilty. He, he, he put it from external behavior to internal need. He said, you've heard that it was said, thou shalt not commit adultery. And it's true. But what did Jesus do? With authority, he said, but I say to you, if you look on a woman to lust for her, you committed adultery with her already, with him, uh, already in your... He took it from the external to the internal. He spoke with authority. And everybody was like, whoa. It's easy to say, don't commit murder, don't commit adultery, and, and to think of the external rules and laws. But now he's messing with us. Now he's getting serious. Now he's dealing with the issues of the heart that no one can see. You can't see lust, but you can see adultery. You can't see anger, always anyway, but you can see murder, right? And he's getting at what is the heart issue. Jesus was teaching as one who had authority. And he could say, but I say to you, and everybody's like, well, who are you? Up till now, time after time after time, the, the rabbis would repeat what others said. Well, so-and-so on Hillel says this, and Gamaliel says this, and they'd go through the, the quotes but they never really got down to what did God say? How did God feel about them? How did God deal with their sin and their need? What was amazing, the people were, were amazed, and uh, he had authoritative teaching. Jot that down. He was not just repeating simple words. He was repeating God's word. He was saying what God said. That's why we have like this, the Sermon on the Mount. We, we know what Jesus taught. Now Mark abbreviates a lot of what Jesus taught, but he tells us that it was authoritative. It was ex usia, out of his being. He was a substantive, substantive and said, thus saith the Lord, this authoritative word. Jesus used his teaching to declare the goodness of God, to declare the will of God, to declare what he needed. We have a picture of that in the book of Luke. As Jesus was handed the scroll in Nazareth, his hometown, 
And he reads from that scroll this passage. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has authored, uh, appointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, to recover sight to the blind, and to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You talk about authoritative. You talk about, (laughs) he says, Today, this scripture about the Messiah is fulfilled in your midst. And he rolled up the scroll and he sat down. And everybody was amazed. Now, it got him in trouble. In fact, he almost got pushed over a cliff right after that. That's why he says, you know, a prophet's not welcome in his own hometown, you know. But he taught with authority. And he said, I am the Messiah. He let them know. And at the same time, it was attractive teaching. They were drawn to what he was saying because it was true, but also because it was heartfelt. Here was someone from the Heavenly Father showing us the way. John chapter 7, verse 46 says, Never did they ever hear anyone speak like this man spoke. I want to encourage you, it's probably not just what he said, but it's how he said it. They sensed deep within his heart and spirit was a concern for God so loved the world. It's how he said it, not just what he said. The typical scribes and Pharisees didn't speak like he was speaking. They didn't share God's love, God's word, like he did. They could probably see him from time to time. Jesus was the one who shed a tear. He looked out over Jerusalem and his eyes started to weep. Jesus showed emotion and it was attractive in his teaching. That's why it says they were amazed at his teaching for he taught as one who had real authority. See, Jesus' authority was not positional. It wasn't because he was a rabbi. It was actual. It was um, rudimentary. It was centered on who he was as a person. One more. Think about the verse 22 there. He says, The people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of the religious law. In a way, Jesus couldn't help but tell the truth. You know why? He was the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You have heard that it was said, but I say to you, this light shining in the darkness, this Jesus' teaching, gave them the opportunity to see truth, absolute teaching. Jesus used his word as his authority. Jesus' teaching stood out, and it was a revelation of who God was. Let's take a a moment and think about the authority, not of his word, but of his judgment. Of his judgment. And this is verse 23 and 24. This is where the confrontation of darkness really takes place. As Jesus is teaching light in the middle of this dark culture, all of a sudden a man shouts out. Suddenly, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out. You might be wondering, what's this guy doing in a synagogue? Well, often in our religious circles, in our religious ceremonies, there are those who are possessed. There are those who are controlled, those who are influenced by the demonic forces. Demons love to hang out with the religious ones. They love to focus in on and misuse God's plan and worship to bind people, to capture people, and to keep them held down. 
This man was probably well-known. This man, we don't know a lot about him. We know nothing about him, really. But he's a part of the synagogue. Does that surprise you? He's a part of the religious body that's there. And he cries out when Jesus is teaching. Here's the truth. Here's the light. And the darkness is being exposed. Notice it says an evil spirit. An evil or unclean spirit. Suddenly a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Now this, uh, clear back to the Old Testament, when you had somebody's name, there was some feeling of submission and overpowering of them. Jacob wrestling with the angel. What's your name? Now in this case, he says Jesus of Nazareth. That was Jesus' human title. Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus of Nazareth. But... He's wanting to know more than that because he says, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Why are you messing with us, he says. There's this engagement with the demoniac, with this demon-possessed man. Now, in the Old Testament, there's not a lot about demon possession. We see a little bit with King Solomon. There's a couple of places that allude to it. But there's very little in the Old Testament about demon possession. And there's almost nothing about demon possession in the end of the New Testament. The, the epistles don't mention it. The book of Revelation, it's not there. Where really we see the concentration of demonic possession is in the Gospels. When Jesus touches down on earth, when Jesus' authority is shown on the earth, there's a Outcoming, there's an outpouring, there's a coming to, to a vision of those who are demon possessed. Now, we don't have any, any scriptures that tell us how to do an exorcism. In fact, if you look at how Jesus dealt with this uh, demon possession, it's kind of the opposite of the way we look at demonic uh, exorcisms today. There's no labor to it, he just commands, and the uh, demon comes out. We see pictures in John, or excuse me, in Mark chapter 5. A man who's gashing himself and he's out in the, the desert. He's far away from people and he calls out, Son of the Most High God. And he recognizes who Jesus is. In chapter 3 of Mark, the demons cry out, multiple demons, You are the Son of God. You are the Son of God. Here we see this one saying, Jesus of Nazareth, I know who you are the Holy One. It's an unexpected warfare. Just like the book of Ephesians talks about the warfare that we have with um, the evil one. He says, armor up yourselves. Put on the full armor of God. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. That's what we see here in this confrontation unexpected warfare that takes place. I always call it a kingdom clash. The clash of light and darkness, of truth and lies. The clash that is there between you know, th those two. Have you ever heard somebody say, um, let me be the devil's advocate? You really don't want to do that. <laughs> you really don't want to do that. What's an advocate? Someone who speaks for somebody else and promotes them? You know, I know there's just, that's just a phrase, but we need to be real careful because sometimes we are the devil's advocate. Who are the first ones to recognize who Jesus is in the book of Mark? Demons. You know, the people aren't getting it. The Pharisees don't know who he is. The Herodians don't know who he is. The scribes don't know who he is. The people... Even the disciples are missing who he is. But the demons catch it right away. You are the Holy One of God. By the way, that phrase, the Holy One of God, that's only used one other place in the, in the Scriptures. You know who it is? The strong man of the Old Testament. Samson. 
Samson's called the Holy One of God once. No. But here he's saying, you are. And maybe it's because he's the strong man spiritually. He's the strong man of the New Testament. Jesus, the master, the king, the leader, where this kingdom clash is taking place, it's unmistakable that the demon is not up to the battle. The demon is terrified and he breaks his cover and he lets himself be known. He's hiding in the synagogue in a man's, um, in a man's spirit, but he cries out, he screams, and he says, I know who you are. People were unaware, but the demons were asking questions. Number one, what are you here for? Jesus, why are you here? Secondarily, have you come to destroy us? See, demons know that their time is short. Demons know that their future is sure, that their judgment, the authority of God's judgment, is clear. They will be thrown into the lake of fire, according to the scriptures. So he's here saying, is now the time? See, there's a period of time here where there's the mix between the kingdoms and the clash of the kingdoms is going on at all times. In fact, it's interesting that it's at a house of worship, a house of gathering like a synagogue where this is taking place. That's why they're questioning, is now the time that you're going to destroy us? Is this the final episode? That's why they confess, I know who you are. There's this partial submission as they recognize who Jesus is and what he's doing. Let me mention uh, the ultimate truth, the revealing of the ultimate truth. Jesus said, the truth will set you free, and if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. The demon knew that. The demon knew that he could be cast out. Mark is showing the power that Jesus had, the authority that Jesus had to judge this demon and to cast him out of the man. The demon knew the truth. He just didn't want that truth. He didn't want to accept the truth that was being evident there. A couple of scriptures to uh, back up this idea. This is from 2 Corinthians 11. No wonder, for Satan himself, what does he do? He masquerades as an angel of light. I mentioned earlier that religious systems, especially cults and religious systems that teach false teaching, they're places where demons can multiply, where they masquerade as an angel of light. They're trying to fake it. They're trying, they don't come across as what they really are. They're trying to pretend. It's not surprising then if his servants also, who's that? The demons. If his servants, Satan's servants, masquerade as servants of righteousness. They're going to come across as righteous, religious, in many cases, in this case specifically. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Their end is clear, but they're masquerading. Have you thought of demons as masqueraders? Yeah, that's what they're about. And they are active. They love to uh, cloud the issues. Let me look at um, 1 Timothy chapter 4. The Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. This clash of the kingdoms, this ultimate truth versus falsehood, is, is seen with these masquerading angels of light and with these deceiving spirits that are being taught. Let me deal with one more. The authority of his power We've seen the authority of his word, his teaching, the authority of his judgment as he deals with this demon, and now his, the authority of his power because the demon is cast out. 
this, uh, this is inspiring. Verse 25. But Jesus reprimanded him and said, Be quiet. Come out of the man. That's a little bit too gentle for what the language is. You know, we would say it more like, Shut up! Okay? And again, Jesus doesn't enter into a long two-hour exorcism like we sometimes see on, you know, Hollywood presentations. What's he have? About two sentences. Shut up, come out. Talk about authority. Jesus commands him. There's this power encounter. This power encounter that just says, I don't want you as a demon being the main teller of who I am. People are going to tell who I am. God's going to tell who I am. Not the demonic world. So shut up. Shut up. Be quiet and get out of here. You have no place in people's lives. And if people will trust in, in, in God, the exit of the demonic will take place. And Jesus ordered that. At that, the evil spirit, <laughs> he, he, he screamed, threw the man into a convulsive fit and came out of him. Yeah, I don't wonder about that. How does he do that? Why does he do that? Well, there's this connection that's taking place. I think he's trying one last time to make this guy suffer, make this man harmed. He threw the man into a convulsive fit and came out of him. The power, the authority, the leadership that Jesus showed is, is amazing. This power encounter. We learn a lot uh, about demon possession these days from the mission field, the third world countries. We kind of see a lot more um, explanations of demon possession in third world countries than we do here. Often we here would just say it's a mental health issue or it's a, uh, it's a disease or something. We would not always see it the same as they did then. And there is a close connection between the two. But as Jesus commanded him, I, I'm thinking about a couple things here. First of all, the... Um, Demon says, us, leave us alone. What do you want with us? Whenever you're talking about demonic forces, they always want to appear larger and more numerous than they really are, okay? This says, there was an evil spirit, and it says, he came out of him. Now, when he says us, you kind of think, well, it must be like that legion, many, not really. It's either us being him and his host, the man who's religious, or he's representing the bigger, broader, demonic pool when he says, leave us alone. But it's pretty clear it's an individual thing. But note to self, Satan's always going to try to present himself as more virile, more potent than he really is. We us, our. Be quiet, come out. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, and he will be gone. This is a I call a power encounter. A power encounter. John chapter 1, verse 58, or 518, excuse me, says, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who is born of God protects him. And the devil, the evil one, does not and cannot touch him. There's a protection that comes with this power encounter that Jesus is stronger. Jesus will conquer. For we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but we wrestle with powers. And Jesus 
shows through this and other encounters that he is more powerful. It's a faith-building opportunity. Notice verse 27. Amazement gripped the audience, and they began to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this? They asked excitedly. It, was, it has such authority. Even evil spirits obey his orders. And the news of Jesus spread quickly throughout the entire region. Fear struck the demon. Terror, in a way we would say. And amazing faith began to grow in the people. Let me mention too, the um, way God uses miracles, including demon possession, uh, demon release, to confirm his word. When Jesus says things like, I say to you, his word is confirmed by what he does and how he does it. When he releases this man from the, dem- the demon power, he shows that the word he's taught is confirmed. That's what he's saying. What sort of teaching is this? It has such authority. It's a confirmed word. Jesus said if Tyre and Sidon would have seen what you've seen, they would have believed. And I need to ask all of us today, if you see and hear what took place there, are you in a believing mode? Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 says, We must pay most careful attention, therefore, to what we've heard. What have we heard? The teaching of Christ. So we do not drift away. Listen to this. How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. Who heard him? Well, the first ones who heard him were the apostles, the disciples. He says it was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs and wonders, various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. God uses things like this, examples like this. God used them to confirm his word. Folks, we don't have a a, a word of God that we're wondering about. We've got a confirmed word where God has used power to confirm the authority of his word. Jesus said it this way, all authority has been given to me. All authority Not part, not partial, not a little bit. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Are you catching that? Therefore, make disciples. Therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. Jesus' position... Jesus' teaching, Jesus' obedience all led to his having all authority. So ask me, so let me ask you today, what about you? What about your following of the Lord's authority? Is Jesus Christ number one in your life? Is he the number one authority over and through you? When you look at Jesus in this example in the scriptures, do you say, I want that kind of a leader over me? Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for leading us to your word this morning. Thank you for the encouragement that comes from the authority of Jesus. Lord, may we not only submit to his authority, but may we see his kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to see, Heavenly Father, more and more of your activity in our lives. May we never yield to the demonic. Instead, just follow you, love you, adore you, and honor you. For we pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen.